perhaps in order to make a brief connection between what we heard from Professor Michael Walzer last evening uh, and this morning about the anomalous complexity of the Jewish identity and the Jewish reality. Just a very brief quote from Buber to connect between what he has said to what's going to be spoken about this morning. And Buber writes as follows. I'm setting up Hebrew humanism in opposition to that Jewish nationalism which regards Israel as a nation like unto other nations and recognizes no task for Israel save that of preserving and asserting itself. But no nation in the world has this as its only task. For just as an individual who wishes merely to preserve and assert himself leads an unjustified and meaningless existence, so a nation with no other aim deserves to pass away. By opposing Hebrew humanism to a nationalism which is nothing but empty self-assertion, I wish to indicate that at this juncture the Zionist movement must decide either for national egoism or national humanism. If it decides in favor of national egoism, it too will suffer the fate which will soon befall all shallow nationalism. Nationalism that does not set the nation a true supranational task. If it decides in favor of Hebrew humanism, it will be strong and effective long after shallow nationalism has lost all meaning and justification, for it will have something to say and to bring to mankind. And so, is our nationalism really different from other nationalisms? Has it been different in the past? Has it been different in modern history? Has Zionism been different from other modern national movements? This session has as its title, Jewish Ethnicity and Nationalism in an Era of Globalization, and will naturally emphasize the national and ethnic side of the Jewish anomaly. Will our speakers also address that aspect of Jewish being that goes beyond mere ethnic and national expression? This remains to be seen. Our first speaker, will be Professor Hedva ben Israel, and her topic will be Zionism as Nationalism is it Unique. Professor ben Israel, a Jerusalemite, has done her MA here at the University and her PhD at Cambridge, and is a member of the Department of History at the University here in Jerusalem from 1956 until her retirement, and also been the incumbent of the Ben Eliezer Chair for the Study of National Movements from 1976. She's also been visiting professor in research institutions and universities in America, Australia, and Germany. Her fields of interest are historiography, <coughs> nationalism, modern European history, the world wars, Zionism in a comparative perspective, colonialism in new nations, culture and politics, and most recently, the history of the university. I give you Professor Hedva Benissa. Organizers who invited me to this conference, which I would not have liked to miss. I doubt that I can say anything about um, about Zionism that um, would be new to Gidi, a great expert on that very subject, and from which I and from whom I have learned a great deal, both from his writings and our numerous discussions. In this paper, I should like to sum up my general thoughts on this subject rather than <coughs> make specific comparisons. Um, I shall examine the connection between Jewish continuous nationhood and modern Zionism and claim that even though Zionism has tried to revolutionize Jewish existence and to replace previous forms of Jewish life by endowing the Jewish people with a, new, with a political identity, this project has failed. Zionism has indeed succeeded in adding a completely new form, that of a Jewish modern nation state, but without obliterating any of the previous forms in which the Jews lived and express their nationhood 
or their denial of it. Nor has it succeeded in changing the opinions of the outside world on the nature of the Jewish collectivity. Some still say that Judaism is a religion and the Jews have no right to a state, or they say that Israel is the only nationalist state <coughs> in a world which has shaken off nationalism. This seems like another link in the famous chain of contradictory accusations. For example, that the Jews are capitalists and communists, madly creative or sterile. Before I, I meant to, uh, before I, I go on, to give a general comment on nationalism, just to lay down my premises about it, but the time is short and I'll have to uh, skip this part. <coughs> Let me now answer the question of uniqueness posed in the title. My answer is that the survival of Jewish nationhood over thousands of years of dispersion and the early appearance in it of traits which seem to belong to modern nationalism make it a unique phenomenon. There is no period in the past in which the Jews were not recognized by themselves and by others as being separated from the rest of the world by their national culture. I say culture to include religion without limiting separateness to religion. On the other hand, modern Zionism emerged formally, modeled on nationalism as understood in the late 19th century. The Jews <coughs> are a nation, therefore they have a right to a state. Political Zionism spoke the language of rights and not that of culture, and declared its intention to form a modern, liberal, and multicultural state. It appeared, therefore, as an imported article which had little to do with Jewish or Hebrew traditions, except for the fact that the Jews were defined by religion. Zionism quickly changed to include more and more Jewish cultural elements. The wider Zionism spread, the more it blended with traditional Jewish history, and based its claims, like other nationalisms, on having a unique culture of its own. In the light of these conclusions, I see my task this morning as stating very generally why I see Jewish nationhood as unique, why I see the history of Zionism as no more unique than that of any other national movement, and how Zionism became again integrated into traditional Jewish history. Now, in the first part, I was going to pick out points out of Jewish history that illustrate the claim for uniqueness. <coughs> but again, um, talking to a great many Jewish historians here, I think I'm, I can safely <coughs> skip that part um, in the interest of arriving at my thesis. <coughs> in the second part, I look at some points of comparison between Zionism and other national movements. The role of religion is an obvious subject to look at. Other aspiring nations were also defined by their religions, even if it was not a religion unique to them. The Armenians, the Poles, the Irish, the Greeks, all had religions, religions different from their neighbors, which helped to preserve them as a separate nation. Another point is that religious establishments also rejected nationalism, notably the Catholic Church, an enemy to both Italian and Irish nationalism. Those who believed that the Jewish people existed only for the sake of practicing the religion rejected Zionism outright. Secular Zionists believed with the Hadaham that the nation tr created its religion as part of its culture. Kaduri, a pioneer student of nationalism, held that such a belief in itself proved nationalism to be a baseless invention because religions were absolute purposes and not instruments for nations. Clearly, Zionism was not based on religion but on political principles. The paradox is, of course, glaring. 
Jewish religion, as presented in the Bible, inspired European nationalism. Once that nationalism became secular, the Jews could borrow it back to inspire their own new nationalism, that of Herzl and Nordau. In their hands, political Zionism seemed like the collective assimilation of the Jewish people into European modernity while retaining their historical identity. France was a suitable model. It developed a strong nationalism while declaring for universal humanity. The Germans, Belgians, Greeks, and Italians had already been inspired by France. Zionism began along the same line of national rights plus universal humanism. And now for some more particular comparisons. For example, is the agricultural goal of Zionism comparable to the German and Czech romantic idealization of rural cultures? I think not. The cry to work the land was future-oriented, meant to create farmers for the health of their bodies and souls and that of the national economy, also to strengthen the claim on the land. The image of the agricultural worker was that of a modern, technologically advanced, educated person and not of a fossil embodying the pristine purity of the nation. Most national movements had a na an ideal national type in mind. Other nations, Germans, Czechs, Irish, were moving between pride and shame regarding the national type. The shame was for wretchedness, timidity, psychophancy, and assimilation. <coughs> Douglas Hyde and Ahad Am voiced the same thoughts against assimilation. But Zionism had several different ideals for the new Jew. Herzl and Nordau and Rupin were ashamed of Jewish traits, the weak bodies, the financial skills, <coughs> the lack of decorum in their appearance and bearing. The ideal type of Herzl was Germanic and chivalrous. Dignity, decorum, honor, courage combined with middle class Bildung and modern social responsibility and technology. Nordau was known for his obsession with physical health and prowess, as well as scientific expertise. With Pinsker, mental health and self-confidence loomed large. For the first Aliyah, the new Jew was the perfect country gentleman, at his best on horseback, farming of course, but not necessarily with his own hands, bringing his children up to mix with the best. The socialist Zionists of the second Aliyah valued men who seek social justice and equality and do manual work, class conscious, ideologically motivated, and always ready to serve society. Many of them rejected learning on principle, but enjoyed poetry and ideological discussions. The spiritual Zionists, mostly scholars, valued the revival of creativity in Jewish learning, which they thought had stagnated. For them, the <coughs> ideal type was that of an educated man steeped in Jewish learning to which he could bring a wide range of general knowledge of history, philosophy, and foreign cultures, which would enrich Judaism. Secular liberal Zionists wanted to see their sons and daughters healthy in body and soul, and well-educated in Hebrew and general knowledge, <coughs> active in modern professions, proud of their Hebrew culture, liberal and tolerant in politics, and treating all people as equals. The variety of ideal types reflects the abundance of streams in Zionism. What attracted people to Zionism? Social scientists claim that national movements result from economic and social conditions such as industrialization. Modernization certainly brought Jews out of the ghettos to greater and more varied activities, but that did not create Zionism. Gellner's theory of industrialization creating nationalism for the linguistic uniformity it needs simply does not apply. There is, however, some similarity in the sociological and psychological explanations 
that show how newly educated people, frustrated by the rejection they experience due to their class or origin, often turn back and form or join national movements which would ensure their cultures and themselves the recognition they deserve. A new German intelligentsia turned against the French-speaking German aristocracy. Educated Indians rejected by the English and by the Indian ruling classes became nationalists. Theories of this kind have long been common in the study of Zionism. Also the way migration to new industrial centers created competition and encouraged the consolidation of ethnic groups fits the Habsburg nationalities as it does the Irish and the Jews. In most such cases, acculturation is attempted until it fails or an intellectual leader preaches against it. Most European national movements of the 19th century stressed their cultural uniqueness in their claim for nationhood. Herzl did not do that, being a stranger to Jewish or Hebrew culture. Also, it was no longer a vital argument. Herzl, in a way, pioneered 20th century <coughs> nationalism, including that of the African and Asian colonies, which also argued on the basis of right more than that of culture. Once the Yishuv be, became the chief bearer of the Zionist cause, it took over the strategy of claiming similarity to other nations while trying daily to build up that similarity. But at this stage, it also included in the Zionist agenda the claim to a Hebrew culture to be nurtured and fructified. Culture and politics together fulfilled the standard nationalist recipe to perfection, and when the state was set up, it served as the proof of legitimacy. Some of the elements of Zionism held, lend themselves easily to contradictory interpretations. The most obvious of these are language, territory, and possibly descent. No one could deny the ancient and continuous use of Hebrew, maybe no one except Hobsbawm in scholarship and literature, ancient, medieval, and modern. By the time political Zionism was conceived, a Hebrew literary revival was well underway, but not many spoke Hebrew for daily communication. The role of territory was also ambiguous. There was a dream territory. This was common knowledge, but so was the long absence from it. Homelands and landscapes are strong ingredients in national movements, but for the scattered Jews, they could easily work against nas Jewish nationalism. Dissent is a subject generally avoided in studies of nationalism, though <coughs> ethnicity has regained legitimacy as indicating culture more than a, myth, more than a myth of dissent. Zionists shunned the word race. They pointed to history, solidarity, memory, survival, and general recognition. It was equally easy to show that a Jewish type existed and that there were numerous exceptions to it. There is less ambiguity about the cultural heritage. The history, the prayers, the religious holidays did constitute a common heritage. Was there a common national character? Perhaps in the eyes of the outside world there was. Every single one of these features, <coughs> supposedly defining a nation, was open to contradictory interpretations when applied to the Jews. Zionist propaganda made sure that the suitable interpretations were put forward. In some cases, the strategy was justified by results, notably in the case of the language, successfully spread and institutionalized as nowhere else. <coughs> In the third part, I would like to outline the coming together of Jewish and Zionist history in order to claim that although the political core idea of Zionism was achieved in the state, the present state of the Jewish people as a whole was not shaped by the Zionist revolution alone, but by older and more deeply ingrained forces. Toynbee wrote somewhere, a long time ago, 
that anti-Semitism would, would die down because the Jews were changing and because the rest of the world was becoming more like the Jews, especially in the propensity for migration. Populations were becoming more mixed and the Jews would no longer stand out as the eternal strangers. We need not respect Toynbee's predictions any more than his other pronouncements on the Jews, but it was an interesting thought at the time, long before real mass migration started. Others have also pointed to signs that Gentiles were taking on Jewish traits in their management of business, propaganda, the media. But this could be seen as soft anti-Semitism. Where Toynbee hit the nail on the head <coughs> is, I think, in foreseeing the shift in the essence of nationalism from collective ideologies to individual identities. National identity is now less an intact inheritance and more a combination of circumstances and choices. Of course, most people retain the, na the national identity they were born and reared to, but there is a growing number of migrants who choose their national identity in the way the Jews had done for at least 200 years. It was not unreasonable to expect that the differences between Jews and Gentiles would decrease. Zionism was a perfectly realistic plan to bridge the gulf between the Jews and the world, and at the same time save the Jewish people from the atomizing effects of emancipation. By adopting the standard form of the nation state, the Zionists were genuinely trying to integrate into the family of nations. There were, however, strong forces foiling their efforts. By the time they achieved their goal, the norms about nationalism in the Western civilized world had changed. <coughs> nationalism was toned down and internationalism became more pervasive. Th this did not go far, was not everywhere successful, but it was the trend <coughs> that the West followed. The non-Western world was still behind in the nationalist stage and Israel was caught in between torn between the traditional inclination of Jews to participate in fostering internationalism, cooperation, universal rights and values, and its existential needs. It wanted to be European, but it had to take a Middle Eastern course to become strong, military, watch its enemy, start preventive <coughs> wars, do all the things threatened countries do. Such procedures are normal practice in this part of the world, but they distant Israel from Europe, which was so keen to shed the habits that had bled it for so long. Israel's predicament also divided it from the Jewish world and created intense ideological friction within it. Israel seemed to many like a fossil of the nationalist age, and it reverted to the role of the outsider. <clears throat> and of my conclusion. But the most thorough reversal to type occurred within the Israeli and Jewish mind. Various groups are perpetuating every shade of the numerous faces of Jewish existence over history. I believe the uniqueness of Jewish <coughs> history has proved stronger than the Zionist ideal of Kehol Ha'amim. The combination of contemporary constraints and the propensity of so many Jews to universalism is shaping the present as it had governed the past. For millennia, it has permeated Jewish intellectual life and provided pretexts for anti-Semitism. The craving for universalism was as old as monotheism. The first believers in a universal God were by definition the carriers of a universal mission. It transcended their earthly existence as an ethnic group and gave meaning to their lives. Their superior creed would in the end unite the whole world behind God. This belief sank into the consciousness of both Jews and Gentiles. 
the notions of chosenness, superiority, and national mission were both challenged and emulated by other nations. When the Jews of Europe relinquished their collective being to enjoy citizen rights, this did not put an end to their dilemma. Most of them could not assimilate. The ongoing crisis of identity drove them to their quintessential shelter of universalism, a creed not only in their blood, but also held up by some of Europe's greatest minds. All of the universal movements of the 19th century and 20th century, including socialism, were packed with modernizing Jews, some of whom believed that universalism was the true messianism of the ancient prophets. Universal movements transcended national borders, rid the believers of the need to pretend to be descendants of the Gauls or of the pagan German tribes. The, their new identity, perfectly suited to their dispersed existence and to their spiritual heritage, was also expounded by great philosophers. Universalism was immeasurably attractive and it could take different forms, intellectual, political, social, and revolutionary, depending on surrounding conditions. It is one of the outstanding theses of Talmon's writings that Jewish intellectuals were in disproportionate numbers members of the socialist movements, especially in Eastern Europe, due to their Jewish messianic mentalities. The boundless attraction of universalism as an answer to rejection made them feel not inferior, but superior to those who rejected them. Their international connections, a potential blemish on their patriotism, they could now regard with pride as stages towards one humanity. Their readiness to <coughs> migrate, to change locations, languages, were all virtues in this world view. Even the adoption of American individualism and the cult of equal freedom and opportunity could be interpreted with some stretch of the imagination as a step towards humanism. The idea of joining a small particularist nationality was as unthinkable to the international capitalist of the West as it was to the extreme revolutionary of the East. It became a stock accusation of anti-Semites against the Jews that they were cosmopolitans, pacifists, and internationalists. Many of them prided themselves on just those sins. What I'm claiming is that this was not a partial passing mood, but that it became ingrained in Jewish life and survived the rise of Zionism. Above all, it was a sublimated form of the exilic predicament to which the Jews got accustomed for over 2,000 years. <clears throat> Zionism itself seemed at first, paradoxically, as a version of universalism. Hans Korn admitted that he joined Zionism as a step towards universalism. When Zionism became more Jewish in its content and more particularist in its interests, the yearnings for universalism reawakened, even within Zionism, and the disenchanted Hans Korn left for America. Zionism had more different ideological streams in it than any other nationalism I have studied. And several of these streams retained a universalist strain. Socialist and cultural Zionism are obvious examples. The former had serious calms, but like socialists in other countries, prioritized their nation. The latter, especially the group around Brit Shalom and similar associations, was deeply alienated from middle of the, of the road Zionism on Jewish Arab issues. They declared themselves to be not cosmopolitan, but rooted in Jewish culture, which they defined as essentially universalist. The twin belief was that Jewish morality was universal, and it forced them to be absolutely neutral on all questions of justice, independently of either their identity or the interests of their nation. This was the ideological source of their political position 
that the equality between Jews and Arabs should be institutionalized in a binational state. The classical critique of this was voiced by Bell Katzenelson, who said, the claim to invoke a Jewish and universal morality against the interests of the Jewish people is a perverted morality. My point is that this very debate is still on. The craving for universalism was not defeated by Zionism's success, and it is rampant all over the Jewish world. <coughs> the Jewish people are more split on more split than ever on nationalism versus universalism. Some of the greatest Jewish minds of the 20th century denounced uh, the idea of a nation state. This is an easy stand to take in America because of the nature of Americanness as an ideology which sees itself, which sees itself um, as an embodiment of universal rights and the champion of any universalism except, of course, socialism. A practical example of this I found in a set of Pesach for the entire faculty of a college named Trinity, of which the theme was universal liberty. I think the academic treatment of the Shoah is another example of reinterpreting Jewish themes as universal themes. About 10 or 20 years ago, it seemed that world Jewry was reaching its heaven on earth, independently of the problems facing the state of Israel. Secure in material and intellectual achievements, free to fulfill the craving for a boundless citizenship of the world, for global activities in business, science, and culture, the Jewish state became merely the cause or pretext for the storms threatening this idyllic scene. My conclusion is therefore that Zionism has not changed the image or the fate of the Jews, that Jewish history is unique, that Jewish nationalism was at first similar to other nationalisms, but then reverted to the typical state of constant ideological turbulence and division in which Jewish ex exilic history has <laughs> apparently irreparably placed us. In other words, history triumphed over Zionism and not the other way around. much, Professor Ben Israel, for a most illuminating and penetrating lecture. Um, as per the wish of the speakers, we'll have all the, the talks first, and then discussion at the end. Thanks also for keeping to the time limit. Our next speaker actually really needs no introduction, uh, for all, for, certainly for the Israelis, but I'm sure also for the uh, for people who have come from abroad, both as a, as a scholar and a public figure. Professor Avineri is Professor of Political Science here at the University and Director of the University's Institute for European Studies, and he also served as Director General of the Foreign Ministry in the first government of Yitzhak Rabin, has had visiting appointments at Yale, Cornell, California, Cardozo, Oxford, Northwestern, etc., and has been a fellow also at the Brookings Institution and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. In 1996, he was awarded also the coveted Israel Prize. His topic will be Between Universal <coughs> Peoplehood and the Nation State. Thank you very much. Uh, I know I should never correct the introduction, but I'm no longer the director of the Institute of European Studies, so Bianca Cunha will never forgive me if I wouldn't have made <laughs> that comment here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me uh, congratulate Gidi and say how happy I am, I guess, with all our colleagues that we're able to celebrate not only him, uh, but uh, also his uh, scholarship from which we all learn uh, so very much. Uh, I am a little bit at a disadvantage because originally I thought um, uh, this conference would be in Hebrew, 
Uh, but then I was told that we'll have to use the Jewish lingua franca. <laughs> so I go on and talk in the modern equivalent of Aramaic. <laughs> uh, Benedict Anderson was obviously right when he characterized nations as imagined communities. I'm not sure that the Hebrew translation of imagined communities, Kiyah uh, Medumienet, is the correct one because the Hebrew Medumienet is a little bit pejorative, whereas imagined doesn't have that kind of pejorative aspects. And Benedict Anderson was right for a very simple reason, that uh, in a way he is a Hegelian. When he says that uh, nations are imagined communities, he means that they are not Uh, uh, they are not uh, material objects, but they are products of consciousness, which is of course true, but in a way also trivial, because not only nations are imagined communities, so is the family, because when we refer to the family, we do not just mean uh, the uh, biological aspect of it. So is the church, so is this university, and if you want, would like to push the argument further, you could say that the individual is also an imagined entity, not the body of the person, but the individual. So we're saying something which is on one hand obviously true, but in a way also trivial, and points out to the fact that any study, and I think what Professor Hedva Israel has just shared with us, dealing with nationalism deals with modes of consciousness and identity, and not with a given reality outside of human consciousness. On the other hand, uh, those communities, when they are, as Gellner and others who studied nationalism suggest, constructed in a very specific historical context of the 19th century, they are not constructed out of thin air. And uh, of course, it's uh, Anthony Smith uh, who suggests that there is always an historical substratum to which one can refer and to which either teachers, in the, uh, academics, politicians, sometimes very, very cynically, we saw it lately uh, in Yugoslavia, uh, are referring. There is something there which can then be constructed as the mainstay of uh, identity. Now, if Jews are unique, and obviously they are, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here and wouldn't be sitting here discussing this, it is among other things because the Jews have existed now for more than 2,000 years as a community which has obviously changed and is continuing to change. And in this sense, in the Western world at least, it is the oldest existing community. There is no other identifiable community in the West, and I'm not talking about science, and in the West, which has proven a capacity both to exist and change itself. And therefore, it, it, it does not fit easily into the kind of taxonomy and categories with which modern historians and social scientists or public figures discuss public affairs. Because all our categories are, so to speak, post-Cartesian or post-1789. And obviously, which way you look at the existence of the Jews, their identity, their changing identity, their religion, it is different. Not only are the Jews different, Jewish religion is different from Islam, is different from, uh, uh, from uh, Christianity. And this is one of the reasons why somebody like Toynbee, who was already uh, mentioned, was befuddled and, uh, by this difference and therefore called the Jews a foresight. Because, yes, we may be something like the Athenians, uh, having a religion that has to do with politics, but again, the Jews are not exactly like the Athenians. So even when one looks at Jews purely in religious terms, there is there a difference. Now, in modern times, and Hedba has obviously mentioned it, that uh, some of my comments will be a footnote to what she has already said. In modern times, 
some of this singularity became even more problematic for a very simple reason. Because in the 19th century, and it did not start with Zionism, but obviously Zionism is the apex of the apotheosis, if you wish, of this, the attempt of Jewish self-understanding among some Jews was to view Jews in terms of modern uh, nationalism, be it in uh, ethnic terms or in historical terms or in cultural terms, but view it in terms of what was developing at that time in Europe. But here, herein lies a problem. Because on one hand, Jews viewed themselves, or some Jews, social, certainly the Zionists, viewed themselves as a nation like other nations. But on the other hand, there was a reality of the universality of Judaism, not in terms of its normative values, but in terms of the fact that this is a people, but it doesn't have, certainly in the existence in the 19th century, a territory which is a territory to which, in which it lives. So you have the claim for being a nation like all other nations, like the French, like the Germans, like the Italians, but being also a universal nation. Uh, which is, if you wish, an internal contradiction in terms of modern nationalism. Uh, the first person, perhaps, to grasp it uh, in a very pre-Zionist way was uh, uh, Nachman Kochman, Ranak, who on one hand adopted the Herderian and Hegelian view of nations uh, appearing, uh, blossoming, and then disappearing in this tripartite the Herderian view, and the Jews, like the Greeks or the Romans, uh, have this kind of capacity of uh, beginning, middle, and then the end. He viewed the Jews as expressing in their culture and religion uh, what he called Ruach HaUma, uh, which is, of course, the Fox guys. But he also had to confront the fact that while all other nations, if viewed in the Hegelian uh, scheme, uh, appear, make the impact on, uh, on history, and then disappear, be it the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, or the Romans, but then they disappear. Whereas the Jews have made the impact, but did not disappear. And therefore he creates a new construct uh, of uh, cyclical development, not just a linear development, and uh, relates it to the fact that the content of Judaism and the content of the Jewish religion is different from the content of other religions because it is it itself haruchani hamuchlat, in German the, or in English the absolute spirit, the Hegelian absolute spirit. The Torah is haruchani hamuchlat, and therefore it is not particularistic, it is not temporal, it is eternal. And therefore he views the Jews, and here is where he tries to come to bring together those contradictions of particularity and universalism, he views the Jews as Am Olam. And only in Hebrew can you use that term in its ambivalent uh, meaning. Am Olam, on the one hand, an eternal people, because it is, uh, it is, uh, has at its content the absolute spirit of the Torah. Uh, but on the other hand, Am Olam is also a universal people. And uh, Kochmar had no problems with the continuation of the diaspora. He was, at the time when he lived, I mean, the, this was, the idea of Zionism was, uh, was not there. Uh, and he never imagined anything similar to it. So you have, on one hand, Am Olam, which is an eternal people. On the other hand, you have a universal people. But it is a people like all other peoples. Uh, if you wish, one could say that uh, Ranak, uh, Nachman Kochmar, uh, had a drash on uh, Am Levadad Ishkon. Yes, uh, the Jews are Am Levadad Ishkon. Uva goyim it chashav. goyim it chashav. It is, it has this kind of a tension. Now, to relate to this tension, it would be interesting to view uh, what uh, Theodor Herzl, when he tried to find his own identity, and his own answer to what he viewed as the Jewish problem in the age of emancipation, he viewed the relationship of the Jewish people to its own history. Now, whatever you can say about Herzl, one thing is clear. He was smart enough not to try to define who is a Jew. 
<laughs> knowing that if you try with definitions, you get into trouble. <laughs> however, and we know, uh, however, there are a number of interesting indications. And some of them are more known, some of them are less known. Let me start with those which are less known. In his diary, there is a notation in February 1897. Now, February 1897 <coughs> is a year after the publication of uh, the Jewish state, the Judenstaat, and uh, half a year before the con uh, convening of the First Zionist Congress in Basel. Uh, he, know, he, he, he relates in his diary that he has met a doctor uh, from Jerusalem, uh, doesn't, know, doesn't matter who the person is, and goes on to say, he told me incredible things about Palestine, which is supposed to be a wonderful country, uh, and about our Jews from Asia, Kurdish Jews, Persian Jews, Indian Jews. It's strange. There are Jewish Negroes coming from India. They are the, the descendants of the slaves who worked, uh, among the, uh, who worked for the exiled Jews in India and accepted, as in America, the religion of their masters. In Palestine, we can also find mountain Jews and Jews from the steppes, uh, types of fighters, kriegerisch gefärbte Berg- und Steppenjuden. I mean, you hear the German romanticism which Hedba mentioned. Now, in an interesting debate, Herzl privately held with one of his first supporters, Israel Zangvi, who eventually left on this one, the English uh, Jewish writer most important in the Jewish writer of this time. Uh, the debate was about the nature of the Jews. Zandville viewed the Jews as a race, very clearly and specific. And Herzl, in a not very kind note in his diary, <coughs> uh, refers to this debate, which happened in Zandville's uh, study in London. And he says, it's enough if I look at Zandville and myself to realize that we're not of the same race. <laughs> Zangwill, with his crooked nose, negroid features, uh, tasseled hair, obviously we do not belong to the same race. Not that Herzl was very blonde, you know. But anyway. And then he said, I can ne never accept it that we are a race. I can only say this. We are an historical entity, a nation, of diverse anthropological ingredients. This is enough for the Jewish state. No nation has a unity of race. Well, that's a very interesting statement, uh, 1895, coming at the time when racism is, of course, at its height. A very clear statement that Jews are, the Jews are an historical entity, a nation of diverse anthropological ingredients. And therefore, he has no problem with having a multilingual, multicultural country. We know how, how, what his view about Hebrew was. Uh, Switzerland is a federal state with, of many languages. He had no problem with that. Neither race, nor language. This is 19th century. Very different from the typical nationalism which is usually attributed to Hansen. In another place, he says, something which may be even more striking to those of us who know how secular Herzl was in his own uh, personal beliefs, uh, not only before his Zionist development, but also afterwards. I mean, the, the quote uh, from uh, the Jewish state that we will keep the rabbis in the uh, synagogues as we keep the uh, army in its uh, camps, now famous last words, um, uh, is usually used by Israeli secularists. However, the only time when Herzl came near, near a definition of Jewishness is when he says, we recognize ourselves as a nation in our belief. That's not a very good translation. We erkennen uns als Nation am Glauben. We recognize ourselves as a nation uh, according to our belief. And in another place he says, our belonging to each other historically is based only on our 
ancestral belief because it's a long time uh, since we have lost any other characteristics that unites us. Now, this does not mean that religion is the content of, of Jewish identity, but that religion is the finis. It is the kader. It is the external, uh, external uh, uh, wall, uh, if you wish. And therefore, it may not come as a surprise, but I guess it will come as a surprise to some of us uh, to recall that in Alt Neuland, at the end of the book, and most of us don't get to the end of the book, <laughs> it's a rather, it's a rather uh, speechy uh, utopian novel where everybody makes a lot of speeches. But at the end of the novel, uh, the uh, tourists in 1923, the emergent Jewish state, come to Jerusalem, and there is a, the temple is being built in Jerusalem. This is hurt. And it is, I mean, the temple, uh, no animal sacrifices, but there is Yachin and Boaz, there is Yam HaNechoset, and then the service is something like the service he was used in a good, not reform, but a good modern synagogue in Vienna. So it's, uh, but it, it does exist there, despite the relationship, which is a very external relation. Not on the Temple Mount. And, and uh, thanks, uh, Alex, for reminding and not on the Temple Mount. It's not very clear. If you look at the read it, you don't know if it's in old city, old, in the new city, but it's not on the Temple Mount because in the description of Jerusalem, the mosques are there and there are the splendor, etc. So thank you for reminding me because otherwise this can be, uh, this can be formal. Now, what does this all uh, suggest? It suggests that even among people who tried in a philosophical way, like, uh, uh, like uh, Ranak, uh, Kochman, and in a political way, to adopt the understanding of Judaism, of Judaism to the modern world in terms of nation states, certainly in the case of Herzl, there is the awareness of the uniqueness and the difference. Now one can argue, and I think uh, Hedva has also mentioned it, uh, that every, uh, every nation is unique in its own way but perhaps some are more unique than others. And this is certainly the case on this continuum with Jewish uniqueness. But it does create a number of issues which one has to confront today and which have been much more, excuse me, much more problematic <coughs> once the state of Israel has been established. And let me relate to issues of language. And that's why I started with Aramaic. Um, one of the interesting debates about the Hebrew literature uh, of the Haskalah, pre-Zionist Hebrew literature in the Has of the Haskalah, of the Hebrew Enlightenment in Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe, appears in an article published by Eliezer ben Yehuda in Peretz Molensky in Hashacha in 1882. And the debate has as its background something which is apparently literary, but it is not. The, argue, the debate into which uh, ben Yehuda gets himself, is the following. Uh, people were commenting at that time in the Hebrew literature, in the Hebrew various periodicals, that there is a paradox regarding Hebrew literature. On one hand, this is 1880s, uh, there has been a very diverse Hebrew prose and poetry literature in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, on the other hand, for decades, on the other hand, the literary quality of those uh, novels is not very high. And it's, it doesn't appear that it's becoming better. Where are the great Hebrew novelists is the question which is being asked. And Ben Yehuda gives it to it a very interesting answer. Obviously, there can be no great Hebrew novels because when you read Hebrew novels written in Eastern Europe, Russia, Poland, wherever, 1870, 1875, they're written in Hebrew. The characters apparently speak in Hebrew, but we know that this is not real. In real life, those characters from Warsaw or Odessa spoke either Yiddish or Polish or Russian or, or German. And therefore, this is a false literature. You can have a great literature only if people will speak the language, and therefore he immigrates to Palestine, and he, the whole project of reviving the Hebrew language for uh, Ben Yehuda predates his immigration. It is a project of how to create 
great literature, and you cannot create great literature if people do not speak the language. You can hear a Russian populist Narodnik echoes here, and that's exactly where uh, Ben Yehuda was coming from. Isaiah Berlin <coughs> made surprisingly, surprising for Isaiah Berlin, in his uh, Bravura essay, uh, Jewish Slavery and Emancipation, an interesting comment about the argument between Yiddish and Hebrew. And we know those arguments have been going back and forth for a long time, uh, until at least uh, the Shoah and the establishment of Israel. <coughs> and um, he says, I'm not very complimentary he things about Yiddish. He accepts its uh, deep uh, feeling and immediacy uh, and richness. But he says, the Bible being written in heaven, being written in Hebrew, is a link between us and the European culture. And if the Jewish community in Palestine or the state of Israel would like to be link linked with Europe, Hebrew is the link. Because this is the language which gave Europe its culture and the European Christians the savior. Now that's a very interesting argument for Hebrew, that it is not a particularistic in, uh, inversion it is not trying to be inward looking, but on the other hand, Hebrew is a universal language. Whereas Yiddish is a very particular language of the Jewish community in a very particular place, maybe it was spoken by the majority of Jews at one time, but it doesn't have this link with uh, a universal culture. Now, with the establishment of Israel, two new levels have been added to that complexity. And I'm sorry I missed Michael Walsh's yesterday and actually yesterday, but I know that he referred to it. And uh, I want also to refer to it. And this is, of course, a fact that there is a major Jewish community in Israel. Uh, the last few days we have arguments, Sergio de la Pago on one side and others on the other side. Uh, where do the, uh, which is the largest Jewish community today? Is it in, still the United States or perhaps already Israel? The issue is not qual qualitative to my mind. It is basically, uh, not quantitative, it is basically a qualitative issue. And the issue is the following. Jews in Israel can relate and do relate to their Jewish identity in numerous ways. And while in the end what Herschel said that uh, religion is the outer finis, and this is really what the Israeli Supreme Court decided in the case of Brother Daniel and is now enshrined in the law of return, that somebody is Jewish who was born to a Jewish mother and did not convert to any other uh, uh, positive religion. Uh, Jews can still relate in Israel to their uh, identity in different ways. Uh, today, perhaps, it's not as visible as it was immediately after the Six-Day War, but those of us who at that time were going to the war more than we now do, uh, could see the people standing in front of the wedding wall, and obviously they had completely different things in mind. You could see the ultra-Orthodox and the a kata person uh, praying, you could see an Orthodox Agudat Israel person praying, you could see a Mizrahi Orthodox person praying, and you can see the variety of Israeli secularists standing in awe before the wall, and the wall meant very different things to them, and I think this is just emblematic of what Jewish identity can mean in Israel. It, cannot, it can be, I wouldn't say totally divorced from <coughs> religion, it certainly can be divorced from practicing religion, not exactly from religious remembrance, from religious symbols, from religious history, but for religious practice. Outside of Israel, it is very difficult, not impossible, today to craft a Jewish identity which is not linked in one way or another with the religious identity. And therefore the issue of the rights in Israel of reform and conservative Jews are much more important to American Jews than to most of Israeli secular Jews. If there would have been half a million reform and conservative Jews in Israel, it would have been a political issue. It would have been solved politically, as all those issues are solved in Israel. But ideologically, it is not an issue which is a burden to most secular Jews in Israel, or Jews who are not Orthodox in Israel. It is obviously an issue of enormous importance
for Jews in the diaspora because the way Israel treats reform and conservative Jews is a reflection of their own identity as Jews, which is channeled necessarily so through religion, which really creates a problem that it may be possible to be non-religious and Jewish in Israel, despite the fact that Arthur Herzberg once called those of us who are not religious going to great great. I don't think we are going to great great. And it is much more difficult to be Jewish without a religious affiliation, I wouldn't say belief, but a affiliation outside of Israel. I'm not sure that Israel has solved the issue. I'm not sure that does for Jewish solves the issue. There are, to my mind, sometimes very disturbing uh, sub, uh, substitutes for this sort of religion. The Holocaust Museum in Washington, to my mind, is one of them. I mean, the Holocaust Museum in Washington became something like the National Cathedral for many, not all, for many Jews in the United States. I think it is problematic because it deals with the memory of death and um, Judaism is not about death, but about living and surviving. The second point is, of course, that Israel has not succeeded until now. With all our internal debates among us, Israeli Jews, to craft a credible approach to how to define, for us and for them, the Israeli identity of Israeli Arabs. Now, this is not just the issue of my majority and minority communities. This is obviously an issue of majority and minority communities. It is an issue that has to do with the fact that the minority community is part, culturally, if not politically, of a world which has been and still is at war with the majority culture. This is not just like the rights of Jews in France. I mean, the Jews in France are not members of a nation that is at war for, or has been at war for 50 years with France. Uh, this is not an alibi for not having solved it or having addressed it. I think this is a great, a, a great uh, a failure of the Israeli political thinking. And since I mentioned Herzl earlier, uh, Herzl had no problems with rights for Arabs in the Jewish state. I mean, the whole political uh, uh, plot of Alt Neuland is about uh, an attempt by an uh, orthodox uh, rabbi uh, who came to Israel or to the Jewish land uh, to deprive the Arab citizens of the Jewish country uh, of the citizenship, and it fails. Uh, but uh, Herzl was not aware, and 1902 it would be difficult to be aware, that the issue is not just of individual with equal rights, but the issue is of a clash of nationalism, because there was at that time no Arab nationalism in Palestine or practically never. In the, in the Middle East, and Herzl didn't see it. He probably should have seen it, uh, being the prophet. I mean, that's the way he's being viewed, right? The prophet should see those things, but he didn't see it. And therefore, uh, the, 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 liberal, uh, approach of, uh, the liberal approach of Herzl uh, is obviously uh, liberal and should be loaded as such, uh, but it is up to a point irrelevant to our problem. And the, the problem, of course, becomes. <coughs> Uh, becomes compounded by the fact, and here we have the mirror images, and that's where I want to uh, <coughs> close, that Arab and our Palestinian nationalism is also not totally divorced from religious elements, not just in its content, but also in terms of its historical memory. Talk to an Israeli Christian Arab and ask him, what is Muhammad to you? And the Greek Orthodox Christian Israeli Arab would say, Muhammad is a great hero of Arabism. This is the same kind of problematics which many secular Jews feel or express when they relate to Moshe Rabbeinu as an historical uh, national figure and not as, a, uh, as somebody who was a mediator of the uh, Torah, which suggests that the problems of Amne Badar Gishkon of Abohimit Chashav which have been following us, uh, following the Jewish people, because of its antiquity and its ever-changing nature, continue to follow us, and I'm not sure that we in Israel have until now give me the adequate answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abinieri. I'm sure your questions are percolating.
please keep, please hold them until the end of the next lecture. The next lecture will be by Dr. Alexander Jakobson, who is a graduate, all three degrees here at the university, and did his postdoc at the University of Köln. His main field of research is ancient history, and he's published a book on elections and electioneering in Rome, a study in the political system of late republic. His current research, however, also focuses on modern history and on subjects such as democracy, national identity, the nation state, and the rights of national minorities in Israel and Western democracies, which I assume is the reason he's with us here today. And um, his most recent book is a book called Israel and the Family of Nations, the Jewish Nation State and Human Rights. Bakasha, Professor Yochus. I want to start with a very witty and apt very apt, I think, quotation from a visiting professor to Israel. I don't remember his name, unfortunately. Answering a question. Uh, uh, do you think that the Jewish people are unique? And the answer was, of course you're unique, but you're not unique in being unique. <laughs> and I think this is, a, a, I think we should, this is, by the way, I think that the, the right Zionist approach to the question of Jewish uniqueness, but I think it, that's a, also a very uh, illuminating statement. Now, of course, this is not to deny that in some respects we are, as it were, uniquely unique, uh, or uniquer than others. Uh, but I think that I think that it's also true that others are unique or, or, or uniquely unique in their own particular way. So um, uh, let us let us consider, for example, the case of Tibet, our fellow fellow Asians. Uh, now there is no, of course, there is you cannot conceive of Tibetan identity or Tibetan culture apart from the Buddhist Tibetan, from the their particular brand of the Buddhist religion. Although, of course, Buddhism as, as a whole is not uniquely Tibetan, but their own brand of it. If ever there should be a Tibetan nation state, perhaps it will be a democracy. Probably it will be a democracy. Dalai Lama is such a nice guy and they're nice people. And um, they will have a, a difficult task of building a modern nation state with this cultural baggage. They will presumably not discard it it would be a pity to discard it, but they will, it will not be easy to make it fit to a modern nation state. Among other things, it should be assumed that the Dalai Lama would, will be the head of state. He is, after all, both the religious and the national and the political leader of his people, which is unique by itself. But consider something else. So he will probably be a constitutional monarch, monarch and that will not be very offensive. But consider the mode of election of this future head of state. This will be unique indeed. The mode of election of this future head of the democratic Tibetan state presumably will be the usual, usual one that the, the, the Buddhist monks go around in villages and towns and look for a boy and uh, declare him to be the current reincarnation of the Buddha. And then that's how he is appointed the head of now national and religious leader, but in the some future head of state. This is really as unique as I can, I, I can think of anything more unique than that. On second thought, maybe it's not such a bad, maybe it's not worse than other modes of electing a state. Not necessarily worse. So you see, you can be different, but not necessarily worse. This is, I think, the universal message on the legitimacy of, of being different. Now, but of course, what we want is the Western examples and not Tibetan examples. Because after all, while denouncing, condemning the West for its tendency to impose its ways on non-Westerners, we at the same time also like to condemn ourselves for not conforming totally to the Western, to the Western, um, uh, to the Western practices or ideals. So I want, to, I want to give you some taste of various European uniquenesses through several constitutional text, nothing like a primary source gives you this idea. I want to start with quoting the Constitution of Ireland, of the Irish Republic, which has been amended several times 
to make it more secular and more liberal. It used to be considerably more Catholic than it is now. And now having been amended and secularized, it sounds that it begins with the following, with the following. In the name of the most holy trinity, from whom is all authority, and to whom is our final end, all actions both of men and states must be referred. We, the people of Ireland, humbly acknowledging all our obligations to our divine Lord Jesus Christ, who sustained our fathers through centuries of trial, gratefully remembering their heroic and unremitting struggle to regain the rightful independence of our nation, and so on and so forth. Of course, every, every, almost every student of modern nationalism knows that there was no such thing as Irish nation that was independent 800 centuries ago when the English took over, so it could not have possibly struggled for its independence for those 800 years, but the Irish constitution nevertheless asserts this mythical continuity. Uh, then, by the way, it says all kinds of things, including on the question of the Irish diaspora, which is also very pertinent in our case, the Irish nation cherishes its special affinity with people of Irish ancestry living abroad who share its cultural identity and heritage. Note that they are not proclaimed to be part of the nation. The Irish in Northern Ireland, who are outside the state, are proclaimed to be part of the Irish nation. The diaspora, perhaps more realistically, are proclaimed to be people who are in a special way connected with the Irish nation. Certainly not all the tens of millions of American uh, people of <laughs> Irish, uh, tens of millions, no, again, many, many millions, uh, uh, much more than Ireland itself, uh, of some Irish ancestry can be uh, plausibly defined as part of the Irish nation, but there, are, there is such a thing as Irish diaspora, and in other constitutions, diasporas <coughs> are proclaimed to be part of the nation. Uh, the state acknowledges the, um, the homage, that the homage of public worship is due to Almighty God. It shall hold his name in reverence and shall respect and honor religion. This is from the secularized Irish constitution. The constitution of the Greek Republic was written in 75 after the restoration of democracy. And that is uh, also a people, of course, with diaspora, with history of national struggle, and with a very special connection between a religion and, and, and national identity. And it starts in the name of the holy and consubstantial and indivisible trinity, not just any trinity. <laughs> no, there are two. There are. Okay, so. Then on relations between church and state, it says, the prevailing religion in Greece is the Eastern Orthodox Church of Christ. The Orthodox Church of Greece, acknowledging as its head our Lord Jesus Christ, is insolubly united in doctrine with the great Church of Constantinople and every other Church of Christ of the same doctrine. By the way, Constantinople, I think the city is now called by a different name, but in the constitution <laughs> of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Greek <coughs> Republic, it is called Constantinople. Uh, it, the church observes steadfastly as they do the holy apostolic and synodical canons and holy tradition, and so on and so forth. Then it says, the text of the holy scriptures shall be maintained unaltered. The official translation thereof into any other linguistic form without the sanction of the autocephalous <coughs> church of Greece and of the great church of, Constant of Christ in Constantinople is prohibited. Uh, by the way, the Patriarch of Constantinople is a citizen of the, of the Turkish Republic, of course. His authorization is needed in order to publish, I assume officially, I don't think they, read, they, they, they burn, you know, they look and they confiscate manuscripts, but uh, officially, at least symbolically, I'm sure, this is how it is. Uh, if you want to, to change the text of the Holy Scriptures, you need uh, the, the authorization of this uh, Turkish citizen. <coughs> The president of the, Turkish, of the uh, Greek Republic swears by the constitution in the name of the holy consubstantial and invisible trinity, <laughs> whereas members of parliament uh, can uh, swear either this way or by their own religious, uh, on their own religious text, which means that the president must be uh, an orthodox Christian, whereas members of parliament can be something else. And I, I talked to a, uh, to a Greek professor and uh, and said to me, uh, we discussed it, and he said to me, uh, uh, well, I'm sure in the Knesset they swear on the Talmud. 
I have to tell him that, that in the Knesset they don't swear on anything. There is no religious oath at all, and there is no religion. The Knesset, remarkably, is a very secular institution of Israel. It doesn't start, doesn't start with prayers, as, as sessions of Greek parliament do start with, not just prayers, this is a, but with, with Orthodox priests and, and in, the, in the hall and things like that. Now, um, it also says the constitution of Greece, the state shall be concerned with those Greeks who live abroad and the maintenance of their links with the motherland. These are Greeks, and Greece is their motherland, not just, the, so they are part of the nation, and this is how they are defined. Not just Greek diasporas, but for example, Cyprus, which is another state, the current definition accepted in Greek that this is one nation, but two states, they are, they are uh, considered part of the nation. And of course, we know the various Greek diasporas. Now, uh, Denmark, uh, Denmark, the constitution of Denmark says, the Evangelical Lutheran Church shall be the established church of Denmark, and as such shall be supported by the state. The king shall be a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Now, uh, now I want to quote something from the Norwegian constitution, but I really must ask everyone present not to divulge the content of this quotation, because <laughs> you will see it's, if it is published in this country, it may prove very problematic. What it says is this, the evangelical Lutheran religion shall remain the official religion of the state. The inhabitants professing it are bound to bring up their children in the same. So please don't publish it here. But I don't suppose it is ever enforced. It's a symbolic, it's a purely symbolic thing. It was adopted in the 19th century. They would not have adopted such a constitution. <coughs> but it is there as a, as a symbolic affirmation of the, of, the, of, the, of the character of the Norwegian culture. Um, by the way, it also says more than half of the number of the members of the Council of State, that's the, the government, shall profess the official religion of the state. Um, um, interestingly, uh, uh, some uh, constitution of new democracies in Eastern Europe that uh, have been the constitutions have been written under the watchful eye of the of the kosher uh, uh, inspectors of the European Community, of course, who make sure that these constitutions uh, conform to European norms. And of course, uh, I know I'm quoting from the Bulgarian constitution. Bulgaria has just joined the. European community with this constitution. It says something very interesting. I think many Israelis would uh, be pleased to hear it. It says, the religious institutions shall be separate from the state. <coughs> and then immediately after that, Eastern Orthodox Christianity is considered the traditional religion in the Republic of Bulgaria. <laughs> Both of those statements. Uh, then it says, the study and use of the Bulgarian language is a right and obligation of every Bulgarian citizen uh, this is for the benefit of the Turks. Uh, a person of Bulgarian origin shall acquire the Bulgarian citizenship through a facilitated procedure. And this is in various Eastern European constitutions now, referring to various ethnic diasporas. The constitution of Poland, now in Poland we know that the Catholic Church is too powerful for any, the, 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 the Polish secularists refuse to acknowledge any official status of the Catholic Church precisely because it is in Poland much more dangerous than saying in, 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 uh, in Norway, I, I suppose, the Lutheran churches. So, but it does say in the, in the preamble to the Constitution that we, the Polish nation, all the citizens of the Republic, beholding to our ancestors for their labors, their struggles for independence achieved at great sacrifice, for our culture rooted in the Christian heritage of the nation. And it also says, uh, and also part of the people, bound in community with our compat compatriots dispersed throughout the world. This is a reference to Polish diaspora. Some of these people are immigrants from more or less from modern Poland, but there are also Polish cultural and linguistic communities that are in no way immigrants from the Polish Republic. These are centuries of uh, of, of Polish history, and then it says anyone whose Polish origin has been confirmed in accordance with statute may settle permanently in Poland. Uh, the Constitution of Slovakia says the Slovak Republic shall support national awareness and cultural identity of Slav Slovaks living abroad and then institutions, so on and so forth. Uh, Slovenia, uh, interestingly, <coughs> Slovenia says it, the state, shall attend to the welfare of Slovenian minorities in neighboring countries 
end of Slovenia, Slovenian immigrants and migrant workers. That is to say, there are two groups, citizens of the state that, that live in other countries, but also Slovenian minorities in Italy, notably, in other countries. These are not immigrants from, from recent immigrants. They, their connection with the state is not uh, territorial or political. It is precisely a national diaspora, or at least a part of the nation that is outside the boundaries because of the change of boundaries. <coughs> Uh, well, the important state of Malta, not far away, is the only one in which the Catholic Church now is recognized as the, you see, the ch times have changed. The Catholic Church has to um, be content with this, but the Constitution of Malta says the religion of Malta is the Roman Catholic Apostolic religion. The authorities of the Roman Catholic Apostolic Church have the duty and the right to teach which principles are right and which are wrong. Uh, <laughs> I also assume this is symbolic. Uh, but the, for example, the questions of, of teaching religion in state schools are not at all symbolic. This is done in various European countries, and there are arguments about it, who is exempt and what exactly is taught. In some countries, these are priests or people approved by the church. There are arguments of, of, about crucifixes within schools. And this, these are, of course, hotly controversial issues. Now, um, so, uh, so you see there are all kinds of uniqueness uniquenesses in this field. I think that starting with the question of religion and state, and more of the, more than religion and state, religion and national identity, which is really uh, important here. Uh, Zionism, uh, well, there is a, a, a particular kind of Jewish uniqueness in that the Jewish religion is a religion of a people, whereas in other, in other uh, cases you have a universal religion, although all, very often in a particular church. They, the Greek Orthodox Church or the Armenian Church or the Catholic Church, for all its universality, its unique uh, function in, in Polish or in, or in Irish uh, nationalism. But generally, I think we should remember that national movements deal with their traditional religions in ways that are broadly similar. A modern national movement is regularly, very often, has an, a secular streak, a tendency. It is modern, it is modernizing, it wants to build a modern nation, it looks with suspicion at all kinds of uh, uh, um, traditional things, including traditional religious establishment, which is very often part of the, of the, the whole establishment against which the national movement uh, uh, struggles. And, um, and so it, it, uh, it is influenced by modern ideas, by modern examples. And uh, very often it is actually started and or dominated at the beginning by, not just by secular people, but by representatives of a religious minority. Uh, the Irish uh, nationalism, which was to a very large degree uh, started by, by, by Protestants at the beginning rather than by Irish Catholics. Um, uh, the Arab nationalism that was um, very largely uh, started by, uh, by Arab Christians rather than by Arab Muslims. Um, the uh, Greek nationalism that was not at all uh, appreciated by uh, uh, people who were influenced by, uh, by ideals of ancient Greece, but not exactly Orthodox Christian people, and the church was very suspicious of, uh, of it, didn't prevent the Sultan from hanging the, the then Patriarch of Constantinople, but uh, I don't think he was guilty of supporting actually the War of Independence. Um, and uh, we can even think about the Pakistani nationalism, uh, Although it defined the nation by religion, but Jinnah, the, the, the founding father of Pakistan, uh, in Israeli terms, he was in favor of a Muslim state or a state for Muslims, not at all an Islamic state, which is more or less what happened since then. Um, and of course, in this end of course, Turkish nationalism, we can think of Ataturk with, the, with his modernizing and secularizing program. So the, 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 this secular aspect of Zionism uh, is, uh, is not unique at all. It is also not unique that those national movements had then to compromise, uh, to make concessions with religion, because for various reasons, because they understood the, the power of the, the emotional appeal of religion to the people, the extent of religios or religiosity of the people, the actual people, not the ideal people, and <coughs> they made use of the power of religious symbolism and religious uh, ideas and religious rhetoric for their own purposes. In the case of the State of Israel, we often talk about the compromises of the, of the Zionist, uh, labor Zionist establishment with the religious parties. And we sometimes forget that they did not just make an ideological compromise, also wanting, uh, 
want him to make use of religion, of, 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 of uh, all those religious resources for the national cause. But they also had to, uh, in, Israeli, uh, in the Israeli society, they had to um, deal with something irritating called democracy and universal suffrage. This is one of the main reasons for the, for the religious legislation. But this is often forgotten. The, the laws is, which established the, the, the religious monopoly on matters <coughs> of personal status, well, first of all, it was adopted in 52 or 3, several years. I'm, I'm sure the religious parties demanded it as soon as the state was established. It took several years, and Moshe Sharet was the one who brought it. Maybe I, I didn't check it, but maybe not. In any case, beginning of the 50s in Israel was a period of mass, of course, influx of, of immigrants from, on the one hand, Eastern countries, uh, Middle Eastern countries, and the people <coughs> were religious and, 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 uh, uh, and traditional, uh, 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 maybe not also Orthodox, but religious and traditional, and they got the citizenship and the vote, and they took part in elections. But also Jews coming from Europe after the Holocaust, many of them were more traditional than the Zionist pioneers uh, uh, that came to Palestine before, before that, because these were no longer ideological Zionists. They, they, these were, mm, Simple Jews who were uh, who were very often uh, traditional, and the religious parties believed in the fifties that this this massive immigration, which would remember this this country accepted immigrants uh, uh, on a scale that is un, uh, un, unparalleled in world history. Six hundred thousand Jews accepted more than a million, more than a million. This this would have meant for for, for France to accepting a, a hundred million immigrants, uh, hundred and twenty million immigrants within several years and giving them the vote immediately. So this would perhaps somehow uh, influence the character of uh, public life in, in France. And this did influence the character of the public life in Israel. So we should think of those compromises in those terms. In Ireland, when Irish, the Irish national movement established its state, this state got a constitution much more clerical than the one that I'm quoting. It proclaimed the Catholic Church to be the national religion and there was a ban on abortion, contraception, censorship, all kinds of things. Uh, total church control on, on uh, almost total church control on the state education system. And many of those things have been dismantled and liberalized. Uh, so the compromise established at the point of the independence is not necessarily what is now. The, the, then there is a, uh, uh, the, the struggle continues, the arguments continue. Also the Greek, the Greek state was much more clerical much more religious than it is now, despite all those things that I'm quoting. In the 80s, the, for example, the Greeks passed a law is, uh, introducing civil marriage uh, in Greece. And in the 90s, they erased the uh, religion from the identity cards of the protests of the, of the, um, uh, of the uh, Orthodox Church. By the way, more or less at the same time when, the, when nationality was erased from the Israeli identity cards, uh, by a compromise between Meretz and Shas, because Meretz wanted it and Shas didn't want to register non-Orthodox non converts as, uh, as Jews. So these things are flexible. They, are, they continue to be uh, fought over. Uh, but, uh, but I think that broadly what happened in this country uh, with, um, yeah, uh, with, uh, with reference to nationality and religion is what, what more or less could have been predicted. And, People don't often notice it, but in the, de in the last decades, in the last decades, the true process uh, that has happened in this country was it has become, in m most respects, more secular, not less secular. Uh, secular Israelis don't often admit that because we like to complain that you know, we are on the verge of becoming something like the Islamic Republic of Iran. But I have, I can bear witness to the fact that I wasted a lot of my Saturday nights in the 80s. Uh, uh, struggling for the opening of cinema theaters and restaurants in, uh, uh, on Saturday nights, uh, and, and, and people don't. Young people in Jerusalem, Friday, 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 Friday of course, Friday, <laughs> Friday night. And uh, young people in Jerusalem nowadays don't remember that it was ever that there was ever a question whether these things should be allowed. This in Jerusalem, uh, Tel Aviv is of course a faraway country, but we know, know nothing <laughs> there in Tel Aviv. Uh, people tell me it's uh, the, the, the problem is to find a kosher restaurant, not a non kosher restaurant. <laughs> so we have, and, and, the, and you, you see the, the, the struggle of the question of who is a Jew, the Orthodox establishment has been defeated, has been defeated in the struggle. It is of minor practical importance, but it's, it is of a, of a great uh, symbolic importance because they, 
wanted to, to control the entrance to the nation, the boundaries of the nation, although they could not control the, what happened within the nation. And so we now know that reform converts, people converted abroad, are accepted and registered under the law of reform as Jews. This has, there is no argument over this. The argument is whether this can be performed in this country, and already you can, from this country, go abroad, get, get converted and returned and be recognized. So this is, they have lost this one too, um, and they, I don't recall many gay parades in, in, in Jerusalem in the 80s, in the, in the 70s and the 80s. Of course, this is not unique to Israel. This is an international trend, and this country is part of the international trend. People, uh, you know, when the Israeli TV was, um, uh, was open in the uh, late 60s, it, it was a, it was a, uh, the Supreme Court had to force the Labour government, the then Labour government, to allow it to operate on Saturdays. Uh, this sounds funny today. Uh, who would care if the, if, if the State Channel didn't operate on Saturday? You know? the, modern, <laughs> the, the modern world of communication works in a certain way that makes this, makes this argument um, uh, superfluous. I wanted to say a few things about diasporas. But uh, very shortly, diasporas uh, and an official link between a nation state and its diaspora is not only not a uniquely Israeli case, but it is. it used to be unique when the whole people was a diaspora. But what the Zionist movement did is cre it created a nation state with a diaspora. And this is not only not unique, but this is a widespread phenomenon which gains legitimacy in modern multicultural and liberal world. And so the final sentence is the, with reference to the reality of the Jewish peoplehood. Uh, are we still a people, Jews and Israel and in other communities with all the differences? Because Israeli Jews are a people in the nation by any, any usual definition of a people, a territory, language, and nation state. But can we speak of a Jewish people throughout the world? I would say that the Jews throughout the world are a people in the sense that to claim that they are not a people is even more ridiculous than to claim that they are a people. <laughs> but I think this is, the best, this is the best thing one can say for any collective definition of a, group, of a large group of people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Yavis. Um, we do have about 25 minutes for discussion. And Chatana uh, Simcha, of course, will get first priority. I suggest this is a mobile microphone. No, but if we are taking no, I suggest that perhaps we move the microphone to the speakers in order, if they want, wish to respond to questions from the floor, and that the questions from the floor come loud and clear. Giving me the privilege of uh, recognizing me wanting to speak is almost as good as having a parking spot. Uh, it seems to me, as I think about what we heard last night and what we heard this morning, that the central thing at issue here is this question of the balance between what is unique about the Jews as an entity and what is the same as other similar entities. And uh, obviously, one can make a, a very powerful case in either direction. There's a great deal, obviously, of both myth and reality about the uniqueness of the Jews, and a great deal of myth and reality about the sameness of the Jews compared to other similar entities. So that it seems to me the real question is, what is the trajectory of the Jewish people if we consider the balance between these two extremes? especially taking into account the one major change that has taken place in the reality of the Jewish people in, re in uh, uh, recent history or, in fact, historically over, a, over the long range, namely the creation of a state which sees itself as, a, in some sense, a Jewish state, has that 
led to the trajectory being in the normal direction, but more similar to others, or is the trajectory in the direction of being increasingly, to use the term that Michael also used a great deal last night, more and more anomalous. Now, uh, it seems some of what was said, uh, uh, what, what Alex said, points very strongly, in many ways, in the direction of being more and more the same, because perhaps because other entities have become more like the Jews. And the situation of part of the Jewish people being situated, being in a, in a homeland and the other part being in a dispersion of some sort is uh, replicated in so many other cases. I, it seems to me that the bottom line becomes what is the best conceptual framework or, or paradigm or terminology for identifying the Jews? And I would point very strongly to the concept of ethnicity. And I don't know, it's very strange, but maybe, a, maybe one finds oneself as a lone voice. There is something that people don't seem, academics who are Jewish, don't seem to like about ethnicity. And so there isn't a recognition that the ethnicity question, I mean, if one analyzes it in terms of ethnicity, there's a whole range of levels, grades, intensities of ethnicity. Thin ethnicity, thick ethnicity. Um, uh, the term that uh, we have in symbolic ethnicity. And I consider the con distinction between all of these and the concept of ethnicism, that is to say ideological uh, identification with ethnic attributes. These are the distinctions, and they, they vary between all ethnic groups, and the Jews have a particular range of their own. Not religion, but ethnicity has to be the bottom line, because there is nothing that divides Jews more than religion, in the sense of institutions of religion, not the symbols of religion, which are then part, can be attributed to the culture of the ethnic group. Ethnicity, it seems to me, is the bottom line. Well, what do our speakers have to respond to that? Uh, so, we'll, there should be some more fun here. Uh, so, uh, I ask to respond to what Gidi has just said, because I think he rightly pointed out to the to the fact that uh, many Jewish intellectuals don't like ethnicity. And uh, I'm not sure whether I like it or not, but uh, I have a problem with where you are, are trying to go, for two reasons. Um, ethnicity, and, and you make the distinction between ethnicity and uh, ethnicism, and I think I understand the, uh, the distinction. I'm not sure ever, everybody in the wider public would make the distinction. But even ethnicity had something primordial about it. And uh, since uh, I believe that uh, uh, nations are not primordial entities, but they are imagined entities, I have a problem with uh, linking it. Secondly, uh, I have a factual problem with ethnicity. Uh, if ethnicity means a common descent in some way or another, it doesn't mean. A myth of common descent. So we're going back to a myth. <laughs> okay. If, it is, if ethnicity means a myth of common descent, um, when, the, when you look around Israel, uh, with Ethiopian Jews here, whatever your view of myth is, you have to stretch the myth very, very far uh, to believe that there is a common descent. Uh, I think there's something else. There's a common consciousness, perhaps imagined, perhaps constructed, perhaps even imported to Ethiopia in the 19th century. I don't know about it, but it exists. So uh, ethnicity uh, is a term which leads itself or lends itself uh, to myth of descent, if not realities of descent. And I think we should try to steer away from it. <laughs> um, Nakidi, I think, I define um, ethnicity uh, not
not just in terms of the myth of common descent, but of the culture that evolved over centuries as a result of this myth of descent, or as a result of geography or of other forms. The, and what I think is that in that balance between descent and culture, um, ethnicity has come to mean culture more than the descent. And therefore, um, I understand the, your stand of seeing that as the, um, uh, as the mainstay of the definition. However, I think the, in, its, in its move, in, it, in the shift towards culture rather than descent, I think uh, nationalism has gone very far and very much in the direction of pure consciousness and of individual identity, as I tried to say, being more and more um, a question of choice and coming to terms with given, um, with given attributes of where you were born, to whom you were born, etc., um, rather than accepting them unthinkingly. So I would, um, I would say that consciousness, free choice, are more uh, at the front of national identity than they ever were before. Obviously, one of the reasons why people feel uncomfortable with ethnicity in the sense of ethnic descent as opposed to ethnic culture uh, is that the Nazis liked it too much. So people, you know, people remember the, to, what, to which lengths this uh, emphasis on descent, biological descent, uh, can go. But uh, at the same time, it is also true that most peoples uh, regard themselves as, in some core sense, extended families, descent groups, while others to which others uh, through the ages have joined. And whether this myth has some foundation, as by the way the common sense <coughs> suggests very often it has some foundation, or not is immaterial. This is part of the culture. Now the real question is then how you can join this extended family. Mm -hmm. uh, and the traditional Jewish way of joining the family is not at all biological, it is of course by conversion. Now this is precise, this, there is a halachic argument whether a convert should pronounce the blessing Avotenu, Vishabarachat Avotenu, Avram Yitzchak Vayakov, Yitzchak Vayakov, and the decision is he should, he becomes part of it. His, the, his ancestors, Abraham, Jacob, and uh, Isaac and Jacob become his ancestors. He joins the family by, by this act of, so you, you mobilize the emotional power of, of descent, of the family metaphor, in order to make a person culturally and emotionally part of the group. As I, I had the occasion to say yesterday, in fact, in Israel, there are other ways of uh, becoming part of the nation, of the, Jew of the Hebrew speaking Jewish Israeli nation. But that's. Okay. I might just inject one word before the next question. I think that might, what might be coming from Gidi, also based on some personal hekirut, is um, he's speaking for some kind of unmediated family feeling, um, not a myth or a metaphor of an extended family, but the feeling of being part of a family, the unmediated sense of being part of a family, it could be that that is what he considers to be perhaps a bit embarrassing for intellectuals who play to the mind over the body. But that's just a personal interjection. Yes, Lakashan. Constitutions are by definition conservative documents. A constitution is the thin man of political theory out of which the fat man of political reality is struggling to escape. <laughs> and what made the account of all these constitutions that were quoted so amusing was precisely that they do not concord, take the Irish case, uh, the Constitution of Ireland, written when Ireland was the, almost the poorest nation in Europe, uh, has no connection really, or very little connection with the reality of an Ireland that is now the richest state, I think, except for Luxembourg, in the European Union. The uniqueness, though, of Israel is that unlike every other state in the Western world, with the exception of Great Britain, is that it is moving towards 
the creation of a conservative constitutional uh, uh, document or set of documents. Um, this is something which goes against the evolving political reality uh, in Israel. And by the way, it is also contrary, in, in my view, to, to what most Israeli secularists feel. It is a profoundly dangerous situation precisely because uh, Israelis ignoring the horrible example of the Shohan Aruch, a codification of, uh, of uh, purported uh, um, uh, static uh, religious uh, obligations, um, Israel is moving to precisely that uh, as a form of, of imposition of a conservative, uh, 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 static, unchanging uh, 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 set of uh, institutions and, and obligations on what must be, what should be, what has to be an evolving, a rapidly evolving uh, political reality to conform with the rapidly evolving social reality of this country. Thank you very much. Would you like to comment? Uh, yeah, but let's take some uh, comments from the floor and then, yes, have a shot. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, I think many of us would feel a lot more comfortable about the blurring of the boundaries between religion and state in this country if we were also part of the European Union. Um, I felt a little like when, when everyone was laughing as you were uh, quoting these constitutions. And I loved your talk, by the way, but you know, as, as you were quoting it, I felt a little like that time when I was watching The Merchant of Venice in England, in, in London, and when Portia says, and he will become a Christian, everybody was laughing. You know, it's like we all feel a little comfortable when we're off the hook somehow. Um, but I actually have a question uh, for, for uh, Shlomo Abineri. Um, Shlomo, when, when you allude to the question of language, as an anchor for national life. Um, I wonder if you could take it another step. Can you imagine, for example, uh, language, the Hebrew language, as an acculturating vehicle for Israeli minorities, not only as uh, Professor Jakobson spoke about last night, the, the Russian immigration, but also for Arabs? And I have a, a, a small story to go along with the question. I interviewed uh, last year for a different project. I interviewed a head of a civil rights movement here who's uh, Israeli Arab, educated in this university. Um, and at a certain moment, he was commenting on that horrible incident where this young man, Natan Zada, had gone into a town. I'm just blanking on the name. It, it's not. Shvaram. Shvaram. Slicha. And, and had murdered four people before he was uh, killed by a mob and so on. And he was talking about the relationship between the climate created by the settlers and this man's action. And he said, it was so interesting, he said, Hakol kol natan sada aval hayadaim yadei hamit nachlim. And, you know, the irony, of course, is so great that on the one hand he was trying to <coughs> describe the uh, influence of messianic tendencies in this country and the, the, you know, all of, all of the sort of gestalt that goes along with that. But in order to make the case, <coughs> he, had to, he was using a kind of classical biblical phrase. And I'm wondering, you know, if, if, if an Arab describing an Israeli atrocity has to advert to the Bible, you know, <laughs> the Hebrew Bible in order to make his case, why is this not like, you know, Leopold Bloom, <laughs> you know, um, living in uh, Dublin, actually the author, of course, couldn't live in Dublin because he was too advanced for Dublin, but, uh, but you know, why is this not like Leopold Bloom living in Dublin and sort of fully cognizant and fully, uh, it, you know, involved in a way in the rhetoric and myth of Christianity, and yet, you know, the, the Jewish other. Would you like to respond? And then we'll take some more questions. Bernie, I, I, I'm very grateful to you, to Bernard Abishai for awaiting this issue. Um, there was um, 
I think it was 20, almost 20 years ago, when Anton Shamas, an Israeli Christian communist, I mean, talk about identities, uh, published his first novel, Arabes, and he published it in Hebrew. And it's, uh, I wish all my Jewish students would be able to write Hebrew like this. And he was interviewed, I think, by Yaron London. I hope I'm not doing any justice to Yaron London. And Yaron London, you know, Israeli, liberal, secular, left-wing person, very, very, I would say patronizing, very, very open uh, to, to the content uh, of, the, of the novel, which is a little critical of Israeli, Jewish, and Germanism. But then he asked him, Anton, why didn't you write in, in Arabic, in your language, and we would have translated it into Hebrew? And then Anton said, what do you mean we? You think you own the language? You own the language? Which reminded me of Heinrich Heine. I mean, there is something about language here. And uh, I perfectly agree with you that language, the Hebrew language, uh, is and could even be more an integrating factor for Israeli Arabs. Which raises to it, well, first of all, if we would be just in a ma majority minority situation, we could just take the language and make it into the mainstay of integration. <coughs> Unfortunately, we're in a political context, and the example you gave just suggests how, how terrible this political context is. So the language cannot be, unfortunately, now as strong as it could be. It raises, however, another <coughs> question. Uh, on the Arab side in Israel, there is now a struggle, part political, part judicial, to make the standing of Arabic as a second official language, not just a formality and a reality. And in terms of civil rights and minority rights, this is the right thing, obviously. On the other hand, this may militate against the integrating role of Hebrew if it is really going to be the hegemonic but also unifying language. So we have two sides to it. I'm on all of your sides as language being a unified factor. Uh, I wish we could uh, disentangle it from the political reality in which we live. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Odlo. Privatize the land for the problem of solving ourselves. Ashad. First of all, uh, the panel that was uh, one of the most interesting panels I've attended for a long time. Um, there are a, a, a couple of comments which I wanted to make about in terms of peoplehood and relations to Israel diaspora. For instance, until recently, if you look at all the literature on diasporas, when you actually look at the Polish diaspora, Irish diaspora, it's always written with a small d. In fact, virtually every time you mention the Jewish diaspora, it's always with a large d, which is a legitimation of a place. But when we talk of peoplehood, when we talk of a nation, and not, again, the figures of um, inventing new Jews, first of all, at least between 65 and 70 percent of all uh, children under the age of 15 live in the state of Israel today, of all the Jewish population in the world. But it's still unique in the sense that we are a Jewish state, and yet we are still not the majority of Jews living in this country. That makes it unique in the sense that the vast majority of, of Irish people live in Ireland and in Poland. And they're still today, no, I'm talking about still today, I'm talking about at least third generation. And I think within that aspect, I think that there is a certain uniqueness which, um, in terms of Israel, in terms of being a Jewish state, uh, the, uh, the, the Free State of Ireland doesn't declare itself as being the Catholic state of Ireland. That, I think, is unique. <laughs> Yes, of course. Well, uh, first of all, in Hebrew, I, I can't. I don't know how to write diaspora with a large D. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, there are plenty of them now. Uh, most Armenians live outside Armenia. Most of those who consider themselves somehow significantly Armenian live outside Armenia. So this is not a game. Now. I'm not saying it, that's the usual situation, but it's not uh, so uniquely unique as many people think. Um, the, on constitutions and, and constitutions being conservative documents, of course, this is why I stress that I'm quoting freshly adopted constitutions of European countries that have been supervised by the, uh, by the European Union in order to make them uh, uh, kosher enough to join the European Union, uh, which they have. Or the Greek constitution adopted in 75. Of course, the Norwegian text, which I quoted, is... Uh, is a, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm sure no one is trying to enforce the norm that uh, people must uh, educate their children in the, uh, the, in the, the Protestant religion. But on the, uh, on the question of what happens in Israel, I, I, I have to disagree. We are not, in my estimation, it's a question of estimation, 
we are not at all moving in the direction of adopting a conservative or clerical or half clerical constitution in this country. First of all, I think we will not anytime soon adopt a, any constitution in this country because the secular parties will never agree to put into an Israeli constitution things that are routinely said in democratic constitution and rightly so they oppose it because in the Israeli context that would have meant something different. Okay, when, when the Canadian constitution says Canada is based on the supremacy of God and the rule of law, and this is from, from 84, supremacy of God, I would not like to, to have this written in, into the constitution of this country because supremacy of God in Israel would have meant something different than in Canada. Then again, then again, if and if we were to adopt such a constitution, uh, in fact, it would be interpreted by the, by the, uh, by the Israeli Supreme Court uh, speaking of supremacy, and it would have been interpreted, whatever they put there, would, would be interpreted in the most liberal and secular way possible by, by the literal meaning of the words and a little bit beyond that. And this is the reality of the, of the Israeli political system, which is not at all only dominated by what the Supreme Court rules, of course. There are traditional, there are still areas of our public life which are really uh, to to my taste, too clerical, and notably, of course, the monopoly of religious court on courts on personal status, which, uh, which is immune from the Supreme Court interference by the present uh, system of basic laws. But the direction, general direction of the public life of this country is that in most fields it has become notably more secular, and it's not just de facto, it is also reflected in, in, the, but in the true law of this country, that is to say, in the decisions of the Supreme Court. Yeah. 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 Ye